Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carlia Swansa, and I am super excited to be back with another artist series on Coffee with Carlia. And I am just super excited about our next guest. She is a fantastic jazz vocalist and a fantastic educator. Please help me welcome Stephanie Nicassian. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. 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 Greetings out there. Good. We're, we're past that beginning part of the semester where everybody's, you know, freaking out and changing classes and, you know, juggling everything and finally settling into a little a little rhythm. So it's good. That's good. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> so I want you to take me all the way back. So you've done so many fantastic things in the jazz world and music in general. Tell me, how did you get started with music? Oh, with music. Well, that really goes back. I, I try not to, to be too long about this because I'm sure people don't want to hear all the details. But I did play piano since I was four years old. I mean, I was picking out melodies. So my parents said, oh, we better get her piano lessons. You know, they didn't force it on me, but I was definitely ready. So I took lots of piano lessons. And by the time I was eight, I was playing pretty advanced stuff, eight and nine. And they, they had me start working with a Juilliard professor um, outside. It was called an outside student. Um, and I would get driven into New York every week and play, you know, Chopin and all the fancy, you know, classical stuff. I didn't know it was anything special about it. I liked it. It was fun. I, I practiced by the time I was in middle to like 12, 13 years old, I was practicing three hours a day, you know, getting up early, just like the swimmers, you know, they get up and go at six in the morning. I had to get up and practice and practice at night. And, um, and then when I was about, and I played violin from fifth grade on in, in high school. And then I was in a little conservatory in Westchester County in New York. So it was pretty intense music stuff, music camps and all that. Um, and when I was 13, my Juilliard professor said, well, now's the time to decide whether you're going to become a professional concert pianist. And I said, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? And, you know, he was like, well, you have to practice seven hours a day and we'll have to cut back on your school. And, and you know, you can't do all those other things. I said, I mean, no baton twirling, no football games, no choir. No, 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 no. And I said, well, I don't want to do that. So that was the end of my classical career. Um, and I always liked business and and um, numbers and economics and stuff. So I ended up going to Northwestern in economics because there was also the Chicago Symphony there and I had a lot of culture. So and I was able to do some music. So but I couldn't be in the music school and do economics. So I got my BA and MBA in five years. I ended up going to business school and banking, got out of bank, decided I wanted to go to New York, but they I got my first job in Chicago and then went to New York in international finance traded currencies, did all this kind of high, highfalutin fun, very sexy stuff for a, for a young woman in those days. That was, you know, early days of, you know, female business power. And it was pretty cool. And I liked it a lot. But when I was in New York, I fell in love with a jazz piano player who happened to be playing in the same area that I lived in, in the Upper East Side. And I was like, wow, you know, all my business friends were like, trading currencies and stocks and burning out and having ulcers and taking drugs. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to have that kind of life. You know, there were 20 year olds and they were falling apart. <laughs> They're very rich though. Um, and I just didn't, it wasn't for me. So when I met, met Hod O'Brien and heard him and he had this, just this life force in him and this free expression and, you know, it was just beautiful. And he was a lovely man. He was, look 20 years younger than he was and we fell in love and you know we started to do music together and I started getting work as a singer and I was like really <laughs> you're kidding <laughs> so I didn't really it just sort of happened you know it sort of came my my un what I had planted seeds for my parents had planted seeds was starting to make me realize I was much more of an artist than I was a uh, a banker so that's the long story, as short as I could make it. Fast forward 30 years after we toured all over, we made tons of records. He made 50 records. I made 15 CDs. We decided we we're going to have a child, which he wasn't sure he was up to. He was like the super bebop genius guy in New York and known all over the world. And he didn't think that that kind of person should raise children. And it turned out he was an amazing father to Veronica, Veronica Swift, our daughter. And uh, we raised her in Charlottesville. And she had an amazing back when she happened to have a, a, a out in Albemarle County in, um, near Crozet, amazing uh, elementary school with Blair Jones teaching who taught them 
in that international music and had a, a musical every year in the elementary school and then a middle school with a jazz choir and a jazz band <laughs> and then a, and then Albemarle High School which had Greg Thomas and the great high school so she had very uh, really inspired musical people all along and then of course she became a you know jazz singer so and got a full scholarship to Frost and so we raised her here and we tried to tour as much as we could you know, while she was growing up, but you know, by the time they're in school, they're like, "Mommy, you're tearing too. You and Daddy are going leaving too much." And so we we cut back on the big tours, and um, we brought her to everything we could for a while, and then you know, stayed home more. And I started teaching at UVA, and I've been there ever since, loving it, writing books, and um, you know, etc. Was that enough? I mean, you know, the touring was all oh, over the. You know, Japan and Russia and lots in the Caribbean and cruises and and um you know there was a time when jazz wasn't so nice as it is right now in the States. It's pretty pretty well founded now here, but Europe was fabulous then. It was like in the 80s and 90s, it was great. So we did a lot over there. You know, so we just went where the where they called us and um you know, a lot of airplanes, but I have something on my refrigerator that says, by the time my ship comes in, I'll probably be at the airport. So that's, <laughs> kind, of, that's kind of the way our life was. But um, we had a good time. You know, Hod passed away at 80 um, in, in uh, 2016. Veronica was in college at that time. And uh, we had an amazing 38 years together and amazing amount of music. And, you know, now we go, go on to the next phase of life. And... Uh, I'm doing more 60s and 70s music and, you know, new boyfriend. I, I live in Savannah part of the year, which is kind of a new life for me. And so uh, who knows where life is going to take me next? Wow, Stephanie, you said a lot. And I want to I want to <laughs> dive into all of those things that you said. Uh, but for people that don't know, tell people who is Hot O'Brien and tell us about some other earlier influences that you had in jazz. Well, um, Hot was one of the pure bebop piano players, like Bud Powell, Barry Harris. There were just, there weren't so many in my, when when I was coming up, there, Duke, Duke Jordan, there were some, you know, in the earlier days, but in the eighties, when I came into jazz, there weren't many left. And now there really aren't any, you know, Barry's gone and Todd's gone, but they really didn't go into Bill Evans and beyond. They really stayed in the, you know, Bud Powell, you know, Charlie Barker, Dizzy Gillespie, that whole, that whole genre. And Ahad was probably, the best one in the world at it. He just had this great groovy swinging lines of blowing like a, like a horn and great composing and great understanding of uh, harmony anyway. So he, he taught me a lot, you know, and I hung out with him. So he knew all the, the guys. So we got to play with Phil Woods and Irby Green and a lot of the, a lot of the giants of jazz. I got to, to sing with very early because I was Hod's girlfriend and, um, you know, and they liked me and they gave me encouragement. Um, and that's how I met John Hendricks was through people in New York. And I joined his group from 82 and 83. He had a, a singing group with his wife and his daughter and, a, and Bob Gurland and his daughter left the group and I came in and we toured for two years. And then I just oh. wanted to tour with Hod, you know, so I, we did more stuff together. Um, we had a lot of amazing people. We played with all over the world in festivals and cruise ships and hotels and everything you can imagine. What was one of your biggest highlights? What's the moment that sticks out in your head? As people ask me that. That's a really hard question. I mean, because there are different reasons for, for being amazing. I mean, we had many Blue Note experiences with John Hendricks, with like Hank Jones and Red Mitchell and Philly Joe Jones and people lined around all the way around the block in New York. That, those were pretty incredible experiences. Um, we played a Radio City Music Hall. That wasn't a great music experience because we, we weren't really prepared. And it was like, completely sold out tribute to Miles Davis and Miles was there and all these people were there and we, we didn't really know. We, John had given us a really hard thing, had it rehearsed, so it wasn't much fun because we weren't that good at it. But anyway, it was exciting. Um, of course, it always was exciting to have us, Hod and me and Veronica on stage together. And we did a few things at, at um, Lincoln at um, Jazz at Lincoln Center. And that was just, you know, that's the most beautiful thing when you're singing with your family and the little kid comes up and she's singing, my analyst told me that I was ripped out of my head the way he described it. <laughs> she's like singing this bebop, you know, like, like it's nothing. And I'm like, oh, give me a break. So that's always been fun. But I don't know that there's one 
I don't think there's one experience. Each one has a different, some because they're big, some because they're just, the per, usually because of the person I sing with. Like when I got to sing with James Moody, Phil Woods, you know, you, when, you, when you have that experience with these masters, um, you get changed, you know, you realize where you're coming from, you know, they're like gurus. So I don't know, I don't know. That's a very hard question to answer. Sorry, no, but you gave us some great stories and that's so true about uh, working with the masters. That's kind of something we're missing now in jazz because you were able to go out and meet these people and they would mentor you and really take you under their wing. But you're great at doing that. Um, and I think it's something very special about a person who's a great musician, a great vocalist, but they can also do that for their child who is a great vocalist, Veronica Swift. Uh, so how did you cultivate that musical environment for her? I didn't teach her though. Everyone always thinks I just sat her down and taught. You don't do that to a child. They will run away. They will run for the hills. If you say, you know, be a jazz singer, <laughs> doctor, you, know, you say the opposite. So I didn't discourage her, but you know, it's a hard life. You know, you don't want your children to grow up to be musicians unless they absolutely have to do it. And, and they're willing to make the sacrifices. And she's just done beautifully she's so so full of integrity for her music and she's at a very high level so i watch her navigating the big agents and the big managers and the, the manipulation and the contracts that are screwy and she's got a, such a good head on her shoulders and she just said i'm not going to do that <laughs> you know you don't usually do that you don't usually say no thank you i don't want to do that big gig that you know with famous you know i want to do this music which is what i want to do so she's she's discovering how to make her music she wants it her way. <laughs> She's a Taurus, the well, bull. My mom's a Taurus, yeah, the bulls. <laughs> yeah, get out of their way. <laughs> yeah. So she's taught me a lot about integrity and, and focus. And I love teaching because I love watching people come alive with their voices. Most of us don't think, you know, we're very nervous about singing. It's very private, it's very naked. And singing in front of somebody is a frightening concept for any of I, for me too, you know. But once you start doing it and realize, you know, nobody gonna hurt you, or no one, thank goodness they don't throw anything at people at jazz clubs. But you know, they don't, people love music and they love to sh be share, have it shared with them. So I love sharing it with the students and watching, you know, my students, 90% of them are not music majors. There are computers, a lot of computer science, mechanical engineering, pre-med, pre, you know, all these, you know, super brainiacs like you. And, um, you know, they do music for all the right reasons because it, it gives them pleasure and they want to express themselves. They feel constrained with it and they want to just see it through. And when they sing and let go and find their real voice, which is usually not exactly the voice they've been using, it's really transformative. So that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> I put some stories in here about what happens to students. I didn't put people's names in them, but you know, like my choir director said I was out of tune. You know, my students will say, oh, I remember Miss Smith, she pointed at me and she said, Ginny, you're flat. And they're like, I would never sing again, <laughs> you know? Or uh, one student came in and said, uh, my family laughs when I sing happy birthday. I'm so bad, my family laughs when I sing happy birthday. You know, they remember mm -hmm. that. And so they, they pull back from it. And so I like having that experience of re-empowering them to sing. Usually when we sing badly, it's because we're nervous and tight. So it's kind of a, you know, what do they call that? Um, it's a psychology term. You do it and then it a reinforcement, reinforce, you know, thing Sounds when right. you Yeah, you think you're you think you're bad, you sing tense, you sound bad. Oh, you see, I, I knew I was bad. <laughs> Whereas really, well, you, know, a, you know, so I enjoy watching that happen. It's very wonderful. That's such a refreshing approach to teaching music because it's always like you have to do it this way, and you have to do it that way, and if you're not doing it this way, you're wrong. So how did you, you're talking about these students that you encountered, uh, but what made you kind of go against the grain with that and kind of uh, empowering them? And yes, you can sing. Maybe we need to try it a different way. Well, I never took much music lessons in voice. I mean, I had choir for 13 years, but they didn't teach us technique. And when I started singing in New York, I could feel I was straining a little bit. And I, I found the perfect teacher who was teaching, actually was teaching people who'd had problems at the ENT hospital. They were marketing people and 
actors and um, you know people that were really pushing on their voices and and he just showed me how to relax and open it up. So instead of people going, oh, you know, oh, oh, it turns out it was even much easier than I thought. So I said, wow, I started teaching that for jazz purposes. And next thing you know, I'm teaching pop, gospel, R&B, you know, everything. I'm even taught classical students, you know, that are not looking to sing in a classical style and classical teachers just to free, free their instrument, you know. And if, you know, if you want to take more details after that, that's fine. I'm not saying it's the only approach, but you have to start with relaxed in any any sport or anything using the body, right? So I found that it works for everybody and I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I think there's nothing more wonderful than, than seeing somebody hear their real voice for the first time. You know, they just go, ah, and they're like, whoa, <laughs> what was that? I said, what did you do? And they said, nothing. I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's so true. That was one of the things I loved about taking lessons with you, just kind of re-empowering me. It was a great experience for me doing that. Um, but in addition to your being an educator, you're also a phenomenal musician artist. So in your opinion, if you had to pick out one project of yours, what would you say uh, is your best or the one you're most proud of? Oh boy. You ask hard questions because the way I operate in the world, I'm always trying to be in the moment. So whatever I'm working on is it, you know? So I have 15 albums, each one of them was it, right? I haven't made a, a recording in a long time due to the fact we can't sell them, but anyway. So the last thing I did was an online voice series called, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really a horrible marketing person. So when I come, when it comes to like, <laughs> myself. Anyway, so I did an online series called Your Tip Jar, and, and I did it on camera, which is fr really frightening. But I, <laughs> you have a, if you do, my first photo session was eight hours long. That'll break you of your fear really fast if you have to keep doing it and keep doing it. You just learn to smile the right way. And, <laughs> don't think. So, but it was a video series, you know, in New York with a top videographer and good graphics. And I'm really really happy with what people are saying about it because it's just 10 lessons and it's like really condensed, but you know, and I, I, so that's my most, I'm most proud of that. Cause that's the latest thing I've done. You know um, I love all my albums. They're, they're really, they're all jazz, but they're all different because they had a different motivation behind them. Um, they were all with hot except for two, one with Bob Hallahan. And I got to work, I got to sing with him recently. And we did a lot of the songs from that escapade record. It was just beautiful. He's just a beautiful piano player and accompanist. And then the last one was with Harris Simon in Williamsburg. And he's an amazing piano player, you know, so I just, whoever you work with brings out something new and exciting. So I guess you could, the answer to would be my next project will be my most exciting project. <laughs> it's not going to be another book. And uh, I don't know about video. I don't know what it's going to be. I'm thinking it's going to be kind of a group lesson because I'm starting to do that. Like I teach a group lesson at UVA, which is really challenging. 15, 15 young people, popular music. And I don't mean just pop music, but, you know, things that are comment that they, that they know well. And so I asked every one of them to make a list of 10 songs, their favorite 10 songs. So I figured this will help me figure out what I can teach them, where I can go and listen and catch up with them because I don't know this stuff. 15 st students, list of 10, that's 150 songs. No two songs were common, well, no song was common to two lists. That's mm -hmm. unbelievable. In my day, it was the top 40, you would have seen the same songs on all the list. It's so exciting because you have people like, I mean, one guy likes Glenn Campbell, one guy likes uh, Coldplay, then you have the, you know, the Taylor Swift people and the, uh, I mean, it's, and the theater people, it's all over the indie rock and it's exciting. So I think what that's where I'm headed is towards teaching more people at a, at a time and see whether or not this idea that we really are all going through the same thing technically even at different levels, we still need to be reminded about certain things that, that I might do that. My girlfriend in Savannah wants me to do it out in the street. <laughs> she, wants, she wants me to go to one of the, the uh, you know, they have tons and tons of squares with fountains in Savannah. She said, you know, like those pop-up, what were they called, the dance ones? 
the where people oh, like flash mob. Yeah, flash mob. Flash mob. <laughs> so she said, "Do that with singing." And I'm like, "Okay, well." So that's kind of where my brain is starting to to wander, <laughs> for better or for worse. I love that. I love that so much, especially the idea of a group lesson, because it's kind of like music. We make music together, but like practicing it, learning it's kind of an individual thing. And so and you kind of feel bad sometimes in a lesson where you're just working on your issues. But if you see everyone's issues, you feel a little bit better about that. Yeah, we all have very similar issues, <laughs> different training, different G DNA. But that just means that has to do with what we hear. You know, so we definitely have different levels of musical knowledge and intelligence and whatever instincts, but that's train trainable. You know, you train that and you, you know, you get better at it. We're all training it. But in terms of singing, ah, uh, ah, uh, first lesson. How did you do that? I don't know. <laughs> that's, you're funny. <laughs> I know. I don't know why people think you have to learn how to sing. I don't really get it. But anyway. You learn how you have to learn how to get out of your way and not think so much and not try to control and not be mechanical about it so much because it's very different than it's not actually so different than a saxophone or another instrument because if you're tight with your tight of the guitar your, your fingers don't move so you need to be relaxed so i think with singing it's even you know it's like our body and our psyche is our instrument <laughs> for better or for worse. So if you didn't get any sleep, can't sing very well. You know, if you're nervous, if you had a fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, you don't sing that well. If you have acid reflux, don't sing very well. You know, if you do any smoking, you know, whatever. So whatever you put in your body, whatever you put in your brain, that kind of manifests in the throat. <laughs> have you noticed? Well, you're, giving, you're giving us a lot of great advice for singers. Um, what other advice would you have if someone wants to be a singer? What should they do? Well, as I say, uh, we're all singers. So you want to make sure you're singing safely so that you're not pushing. If your body hurts when you sing, you're not doing it well. It should never hurt. So your body will tell you, you know, that, and we do have instincts that serve us wrong. You know, we think we want to be louder. If we push on it, we get hurt. We don't push to be louder. We support and relax. So there's kind of some counter intuitive things. We tend to think up. Ah, oh, when, I, when I do that, I can't go up because it's not up there. So we have to learn some of those just so that we don't fall into those traps technically. And then you just start singing. A few little tips, you know, my tip jar, 10 lessons. It's going to open your throat. You have to develop musical skills as a singer. Some singers think they never lead, need to learn how to read music. They never need to learn to play the piano. It's just not right. You know, if you're in a choir and, you know, Joan is sitting next to you and she knows all the answers, you listen to Joan and you sing fine. Or you're, you know, listen, singing along with a recording, you're, you're copying Beyonce. But if you're singing just with the piano, you know, you have to come up with your own sense of pitch and rhythm. And so that requires more skills. And so I would say to anyone who wants to do it, develop your skills, get music. You have to get it in your key. That's what we're talking about in the class, finding sheet music or lead sheet, getting it in your key, practicing it with the track, not with the melody behind it. And um, make sure you're just singing safely. And then, you know, there's certain places in the song that present challenges and we learn what can I do to not reach up? What can I do to not lose my breath? And all those are actually symptomatic of being tight. <laughs> so we just discover them, do a little, it's really, singing is kind of like the obvious, most easiest thing we do. It's even easier than walking when you think about it. <laughs> we were screaming and, and singing long before we're walking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't, I don't like the fact we made it into a big deal, you know. It, musically, yes, it's a big deal. If you're going to sing an aria, that is a big deal. If you're going to sing a bebop solo, that requires incredible, you have to be relaxed, you have to have technique, but you have to have the brain that's hearing. You have to hear that in your brain, because if your picture isn't clear, it doesn't come out well. So I have to hear it. And then we have to sing it. So my advice is just plow into some piano, some voice lessons, some, you know, get some music, take some, take some easy lessons. Don't take anything that's going to make you 
<laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't know. Everyone has a different feeling about what kind of teacher they want. I'm the kind of teacher that, that tries to not make it so complicated because we're not singing classical. Classical music's more complicated and it requires certain kind of tone production. Um, it's much more head voice for the ladies, et cetera. Um, and so I don't sing classical music. So I don't need that kind of training. I have I, I have taken some lessons because I had to sing it once and I, I passed the test, but it was hard work. <laughs> so, um, but most of the time we're singing pop music and, and even jazz and, and just making sound is not that that hard. It's more the musical side of it. And how do you train your music brain? Well, you train your rhythm. You know how many people are in Robert Jaspe's Learn to Groove class? He has gazillions of them. And the African dance class because they're, they're, they want to get more in tune with rhythm. And then you learn harmony. Harmony, you can learn a little bit at the piano. Learning to play the piano takes 20 minutes. I, I teach it on my online series. <laughs> No, that's very true about, wow, that's great advice. And it's so true about the piano. I started playing the piano first. Um, that has been just the most helpful thing. Also just with gigs and people, people like a piano, a singer, piano player that they can hire one less person. So that's also. <laughs> but there's that come up to me with Hod and they'd say, they turn to him right in front of me and say, don't you sing? And I'm like, no, he doesn't. He needs a listener. <laughs> but it was so funny. No, you, but you sing and play great, Carly. You're really, you're, you're very inspiring to listen to. No, I don't say things like unless I mean it, because you're, you're very, very honest in your musicality. You're not trying to be a singer. You're not putting on an act. You know, you're just here. It is. You know, it's really great. I, I love your music. I hope you get lots of gigs in Charlottesville out there. <laughs> oh, thank you. Say it again for the people. <laughs> Hire Carlier <laughs> for money, Thanks. for real money. <laughs> real, real money is important. Yeah. yeah, I love how like we used to make a hundred dollars for a gig and a hundred dollars in CD sales, and now we don't get the CD sales. We're still getting a hundred dollars for the guests. Wait a minute, that's a fifty percent reduction in uh, real pay. Anyway. Well, talk a little bit about this. So you've been in music a long time. And like you said, you were talking about CDs and now they're streaming. There's just so much more with music business. Um, how has that affected you or what would you say about that? It's a killer. You know, you know, they used to say video killed the radio star. Well, digital killed everything. Digital <laughs> killed CDs, record production, radio, all the things that were involved in this beautiful you know, um, in, environment, what do you call it? Uh, ecosystem, you know, we had the artist, the press that would be pre-pressed for your gigs. There would be, the radio would promote it. Then the record company would underwrite it. And then you'd go to the, do the gig and you'd sell a lot of merchandise and everybody would be happy. Now you don't have most of those elements. Although I'm going to do it again. Sorry guys, I'm really feeling obnoxious today. <laughs> This, this is Veronica's new CD, it just came out, right? It's called it's called Veronica Swift, but it's, so she has CD, but she has Ooh, vinyl. vinyl. And last time she did vinyl, she sold two, look at this. It's rad. Wow, that's pretty. She sold two pressings of it. So I do think that there's still life in the vinyl world. I don't, I have never made vinyl, but um. You don't, we don't make any money from the streaming and, and all that stuff, you know, pennies, you know, so that's anyway, why is money important? Because it attracts music, people into the business and keeps the music alive, makes people want to do it. And, um, you know, most musicians have another job, you know, in order, I don't want to talk about it. this too depressing, but it's, okay, it's but I think it's important because people think, oh, they're, you know, releasing music, they're doing this, they must have so much money. Uh, and <laughs> And the pandemic really showed like everyone was depending on the arts to kind of uplift them, whether that was watching TV or listening to music. But these are the people who are severely underpaid for their art. So I thought it was important to share. Yes. And and most people didn't make money from all those share, streamings and things. Some people figured out how to do it that were more well known, charged charge money for the streaming. But most of us just gave away really good programming. But we did reach a lot of people. You know, they always say, but you got a lot of exposure. Yeah, but exposure doesn't pay the rent. <laughs> you know, so it's it's really important to find a way to support live music and tip well and 
byproduct. It's it just it, it's I'm always surprised. I mean, I've had that experience in Charlottesville before where I did a gig in a restaurant and people loved it. They lined up and they, you know, they would support it for about two or three months and then phew, gone. And then they say, and of course, then went away. And I and they say, well, what happened to your gig? And I said, well, people stopped coming. So, you know, when the novelty wore off. And so, you know, but we love that. We love that. We want it. Can you do more? And so it's it it really is totally demand-based. It really is. If you guys come out and, and and support live music and pay are willing to pay a cover charge, willing to pay an entry fee so that they can pay the band. And and you know, then there's a world out there. So it's pretty tricky. And everybody's kind of tight on money, but when I see my students not wanting to pay, you know, three ninety five to buy a piece of sheet music to learn to sing a song, I'm it really <laughs> It, it cuts deeply because I remember going to Shermer's in New York and I just couldn't wait to spend a fortune buying sheet music and books and opening them up. And it was like such a great experience. So it's 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 a very difficult world for the artist right now. Um, it, and I agree with you. I think that the need for the art, art is greater than ever. When the world is in tough straits and we're confused and we're looking for leadership and, and inspiration, we turn to the arts. <laughs> I mean, we did in the 60s. We, we wouldn't have survived without Peter, Paul, and Mary and the Doors. And I mean, we would not have survived without people saying, come on, people now, smile on your brother, everybody got together. I mean, they were singing those lovely, you know, positive empowerment songs in the midst of a really bad time, economically, politically, you know, everything was falling apart, the war, the whole thing. Um, so I hope, I believe in people. I think we'll, we'll figure it together. We'll figure it out. We'll turn off our screens a little bit and, you know, get in with, be with each other more, you know, where it's real. So I think so. I, I believe in the people too. I do. So now something on a lighter note, I have some fun questions. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite thing to splurge on? To splurge, spend money. <laughs> yes, like you must have it. You must get it no matter what. Well, I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to be guilt-free when I buy something. Right. So I definitely when I go to New York, I splurge on going to a jazz club. If I can't get someone to comp me because I know them or whatever. But that's one hundred dollars of splurging or taking myself out to a big you know, fancy dinner or something. That's a splurge for me, for an artist. Um, I know it sounds very basic, but artists just don't do that. I had my bathroom redone this summer. That was a splurge because I've never had any work done in my house because it's expensive. So anything that I do for myself, oh, I went to a spa this summer with my girlfriend. That was a really great moment of taking care of myself, which I really needed to do. I just I just don't do it enough, you know? And when I did go to therapy, which was a lot, long time ago, <laughs> I probably should go again. They said, what did you do for yourself this week? And I went, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm trying to get better at that. Just do something that just for fun, a massage, my nails done, get my hair done. Something that's just for me, you know. And I know I that's not it. Oh, I went to you Israel. Like Self-care is very important. People often neglect it. So that's a great one. Yeah. So I, Carl and I went to Israel last summer. And this summer we, we splurged and went to uh, California to see Veronica's new house. So we've been taking some trips, which also is a splurge. <laughs> nice. I love it. Okay. Tell me, who would be your dream collaboration? Mm, boy. I guess I haven't given myself permission to ask that question too much because uh, that's a hard one to answer. I've always wanted to meet Barbara Streisand, actually. And I don't know why that that desire, I guess because she was so much a part of my childhood, but I don't know if she'd be so nice to meet. <laughs> um, um, gosh, in the jazz world, it's so hard these days. I know, I know most of the people that are famous in the jazz world, so that doesn't, collaboration. Hmm. Will we ever see a Veronica Swift? song you and veronica have a song yeah together? we usually have at least one or two gigs together you know in the year but she's been she's been really concentrating on her on launching her solo career so we do we do intend to do that she's just changed management and so once in a while i sneak in i sit in somewhere or she'll come in sneak in and sit in with me but it just can't be announced but um she she actually wants to make a hot o'brien record she just Got to get through. She got one more album to do for Mac Avenue, and she's got it all figured out already. She's kind of in this 
she's launching a lot of, of uh, original music that's fantastic. And it's not, it's really closer to, I hate to say the word pop because it makes it sound like it's going to be really too simple, but it's really catchy stuff. And I like it. It's got, it's got a beat. It's, it's got little jazzy stuff in it, but it's really good music. So she's doing one called Room with a View. And it's like, I got a room with a view. Boom, 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 boom. I got a room with a view. Boom, 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 boom. It's like really kind of funky, jazzy, shuffly, fun stuff. So I hope I get to do things with her. I will tell her you ask me that question. Okay. <laughs> Okay, it'll push it along. Okay, so I asked everyone this question. I don't know if you're gonna have an answer, but in sync or Backstreet Boys? <laughs> Boy, I don't know either <laughs> very well, but I think in sync had some some things I remembered vaguely. I think they're both very good harmony harmony people, and you know, good energy on stage, but not my generation. <laughs> Okay, what will, what will be a group that's more so? I mean, yeah, Take Six. Do you know Take Six? I do know Take Six. I have I have their album on vinyl. <laughs> I think, oh, you do? I think Take Six is the best vocal group that's come along since, you know, the four freshmen. I mean, they're just so amazing. I would definitely love, oh, I would do something with them. I would like to have a collaboration with the Count Basie Band, which may, may happen, actually. I've got to follow up on that. Someone told me they're interested in bringing me in. You know, any of those... I like singing with the big bands once in a while. Oh, I'm going to do the holiday concert at UVA this year. I'm going oh. to do sing with the symphony, which I've done oh. two years, two times before, but a long, it's been a while. So it's going to be really fun. Those were always wow. such great concerts. They sell out right away and they're just so uplifting. And so that's, that's happening. And uh, what else? Collaboration. You really got me thinking on that one. <laughs> Really, because I'm thinking I would rather do something with a pop person, you know, but it would have to be someone who's really, I don't know if it would be Gaga or I don't know if it would be Bruno Mars. Ooh. Somebody who's got like a rhythmic, rhythmic thing going. I don't Gotta know. Gotta have some pizzazz. Well, I have some pizzazz, yeah. Somebody who really gets the jazz stuff, but I don't know. I will give that some thought and I will allow myself to open to the universe that anything is possible. <laughs> I love that. Let me know when you come up with one. Let me know. Yeah, I better do some meditation on that one. <laughs> it's not, okay. not going to happen in my planning brain. You know, it's going to happen when I'm like, um, oh, yeah, <laughs> Barbara. Oh, yeah, Las Vegas. <laughs> Cher, I'd like, I'd like to meet Cher. I mean, I don't know who could sing together, but she's our half Armenian, you know. So oh, yeah. she was that whole thing about. Native American, that was not, not true. She's Az Azmarian, Azarian, I forget the, her last name, but she's half Armenian, so. One of my sisters, sisters in song. <laughs> wow, well, that's great. Stephanie, Wonder? we had Stevie Wonder. Wonder. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> How about Earth, Wind and Fire or, or, or one of those great funky groups with all the horns. Yeah. I love it. I hear it now. I hear it. Can you hear it? Because I have a strong voice, so it works well with the big bands. Sometimes women's voices don't carry over the big bands, but um, mine does. So it's a, it's a very intriguing question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Stephanie, I've had a fun time. So before you leave, is there anything else? What's next? What do you want to well, tell the people about? Well, I hope everybody will sing and engage in singing. I mean, you know, I have books on singing. I have books on jazz. I have private lessons. I have all kinds of things. I'd be happy to talk to you, anybody out there about it. Um, and then I have concerts all over the place at, on my website. Um, next is coming up next week, which will be, I think it's going to be the day you're airing this maybe at the uh, Lake Anna Jazz Festival. And I go to Savannah, I go to Atlanta. I discovered an amazing piano player in Atlanta. Oh, fabulous. Louis Haribo is fabulous. I'm going to be in Florida. I'm going to be in Newport, mostly around the East Coast This at the at the moment. I'm doing a lot on the East Coast. But um, What's your website so we can check out these dates? What's your website? Stephanie Nicassian, that one right there. 
stephanienicassi.com. Great. Thank and, you so uh, much, Stephanie. Oh. Well, check out Veronica's stuff too. And uh, maybe we'll be, we'll be in New York together um, Christmas week. I have gigs uh, 17th, 20th, 22nd, 23rd in New York, and she's coming there. So chances are she'll be able to sit in with me. That's what I'm hoping. I'll be at Chelsea Table and Stage in Manhattan on the 20th, which is a great new room. And uh, I might be able to convince her to do that with me. Oh, that'd be great. You heard it here, everybody. Stephanie the Cassian, you can check out her website. Also check out Veronica Swift. I think she's at Veronica Swift on all social medias. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you, Carly. I hope we get to sing together soon. Yes, Let's very soon. Out. Collaboration. Collaboration. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.